I'm giving this presentation along with Dr. Richard Price from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. So we want to just start off by saying we have no conflict of interest and we are both uh, researchers and we do a variety of uh, studies with different companies and so those are listed here on the slide. So here's where we're going to go. We're going to talk about this concept of the blue light hazard. We'll give a little bit of an introduction, talk about sources of exposure, We'll define what the blue light hazard is, and then talk about some evidence for effects from what we know from historical literature. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we know uh, right now regarding the threat of blue light hazard. Then we're gonna turn over to Dr. Price, and he's gonna talk about this specifically related to dentistry and talk about it in terms of uh, exposures you might get from headlamps and curing lights, exposure limits and magnification, showing some of the research he's been doing in this area. And then we'll summarize at the end. So just to sort of start off, this uh, is not a new thing. Uh, the, the exposure to bright light has been an issue since Aristotle back uh, 300 years before uh, Christ. It was discussed by uh, Galileo in the 1600s and also Sir Isaac Newton. So it's not like we've stuck our heads in the sand about it, but we don't probably know as much as we probably could have by this time. If you look through PubMed and use these search terms, blue light hazard with retinal effects and or macular degeneration, these are the big issues for us. We see more than 50 citations from 1983 to the present and about a third of these have come within the last couple of years. So it's gaining momentum in terms of interest for people. Well, we're all exposed to blue light and you probably already realize this, your, your cell phone, your monitor, your, your uh, reading device, all the sunlight, LED headlamps, et cetera. And it's in everyday sources. And there's a nice monograph that was written about this in 2013, as you see at the lower right-hand corner. And they showed some interesting results about different sources and how much blue light energy is actually put out by them in the, from the spectrum. And on the left side of the screen now, you can see incandescent, fluorescent, and halogen bulbs. Now, these are the fluorescent lights you would typically see in the ceiling. And you see only a few percent of the light emitted by those sources is actually in the blue light spectrum. So pro probably not much of a concern. And then we look at the newer fluorescent light bulbs and uh, daylight, normal daylight, and cool white LEDs. And you can see that we can get up to 25 to 35% of the output from those lights is in this range and dental headlamps also uh, provide this type of output. So what is the blue light hazard? So by definition, it's the potential for photochemically induced retinal injury resulting from electromag electromagnetic radiation exposure at wavelengths primarily between 400 and 500 nanometers. It turns out the eye is most sensitive at around 440 nanometers as shown in this chart. So if we take a look at what happens when normal light, daylight comes through the uh, ozone layer, we see that we get the loss of UVC light, the, the light purple up there. And it, then the light comes through and reaches our eye. And what we see is that most of the UV, the A and the B is absorbed by the lens. The visible light passes through and reaches the retina and the macula on the back of the eye. And that's where most of the visible light is absorbed. And that's why we're interested in this. And that's why blue light hazard really revolves around retinal injury. So blue light absorbers in retinal pigment epithelium uh, absorb the light, and that's where we get some issues, rhodopsin and lipofusin, various types of proteins, et cetera. And they absorb the light, and they kick up to a higher energy, and we get these photooxidative reactions. And this, these cause uh, damage and eventually uh, program cell death, apoptosis. And that creates then further debris, which is a better absorber for more light coming in. And so the problem perpetuates. In fact, the retina becomes more sensitive than to further damage. So from a historical perspective, we know from back in 1966, studies in rats, which showed retinal damage when exposed to green and blue light. And about 10 years later, there were studies in monkeys and they showed retinal lesions this is where they really identified through lasers, uh, laser exposure that the eye was most sensitive to 441.6 nanometers. And in the 80s, uh, we had various groups coming out and looking at this and, and some maximum daily exposure limits for dental quartz tungsten halogen lamps were, were cited by the industrial hygienists. 
then in 86, uh, we had a paper from in the ADA and discussion in the ADA talking about filters for visible light curing. And Richard will talk more about this in a bit, but you'll see that the glasses that are available are very good at reducing the transmission of blue light to the eye. In 2006, further studies on looking at retinal lesions in monkeys, and they revised the exposure limits from 76 and revised them uh, to be more sensitive by about 10 times. And it's interesting to note that no similar work has been carried out to see if dental LED curing lights cause retinal lesions in animals and for sure in humans as well. Now this issue has been uh, forefront of a number of different publications and groups over the years, uh, often looking at things like uh, uh, adult macular degeneration, which we'll abbreviate as AMD. So in all different areas from the sun, uh, we see potential hazards from visible light curing units back in 87 published in JDR. And then in 92, the Journal of uh, American uh, Medical Association Ophthalmology looking at high light uh, blue light levels potentially being associated with adult macular degeneration. So 2004, we see retinal damage from operating microscopes. Then down to the lower left, 2006, the British Dental Journal produced a safety uh, a statement for the dental operatory. We've known uh, from 2011, sunglasses or contact lenses can be used to reduce the risk for AMD. And then 2013, British Journal of Optical talks about sunlight as a risk and the AMA as well in 2016. And then a, a paper from the French Agency for Food, Environmental and Occupational Health and Safety talks about reducing exposures and using warm white light as opposed to cool white. And they have discussed the strengthening of regulations of exposure to these blue lights. Now, a nice position statement came out uh, in April of 2019 from the Commission on Illumination, stating that blue light hazard is not an issue for white light sources, but may be possible with sources that prim primarily emit blue light, and that the use of sources emitting primarily blue light are a cause of concern for exposure to children's eyes. The blue light hazard exposure limit should be reduced by a factor of 10 for children. And that claims that exposure to blue light cause age-related macular degeneration are currently speculative and not supported by the peer review literature. So that's what we know at this point. So let's take a look at some of the things, we, other things we do know. We know that visible light ambient radiation endangers the eyes. So we've kind of talked about this and it gets worse as we get older. And that's because the naturally protective antioxidants that are present in the retinal epithelium are reduced. And we have this increase in light absorbing uh, chromophores. So we get more energy being absorbed by the epithelium. We know that the particular risk for retinal degeneration and for macular degeneration is the 400 to 440 nanometer range. And an interesting study really recently looked at comparing 460 nanometer blue light to UVA or B and its effect on cataract formation in porcine lenses. This is an ex vivo study, but so that brings a whole other issue in terms of cataract formation. We know that the hazard is reduced with sunglasses or intraocular lenses, filtering this light, and Richard's going to talk more about that. And it's important that we don't reduce or elim totally eliminate blue light because we need 480 nanometers for our, to trigger our circadian rhythm. So the question then becomes, in dentistry, what's the actual extent of the risk, and is there a risk for AMD? And that would seem to be inconclusive. So we also want to know about the effectiveness and specificity of shielding. It's important to remember that uh, all dental practitioners and people who run offices have to follow OSHA guidelines. And OSHA specifically states that an office shall furnish a place of employment free from recognized hazards. So this is an issue and we have to pay attention to it. So there's a lot of blue light concerns in the dental office and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Price now to talk about this. Thank you, Jack, for that introduction. So this is uh, Richard Price here talking to you from Canada. I'm a dentist. I'm also a researcher with a great interest in dental curing lights. I've published a few papers on the blue light hazard. And today I really want to talk to you about the blue light concerns in the dental office. As you'll learn today, uh, this potential blue light hazard really shouldn't be news to anybody. 
But as you just heard from Jack about uh, OSHA, it really is a concern to everybody who runs a dental office. You really don't want to have OSHA knocking at your door. So as Jack said, in addition to all the blue light from computer screens and LED lights at home, dentists are exposed for hours a day to blue light coming from LED headlamps, powerful operatory lighting, and of course from dental curing lights. Now of note, and this isn't a dig, it's just to say that medical researchers and grant reviewers don't understand that we're using this for hours a day. Now, despite the strict COVID lockdown, um, they've just completed a study looking at a wide range of LED headlamps that produce white light. And most of you don't know that the white light from these LED headlamps actually contains a lot of blue light. Here we can see a whole variety of LED headlamps. You can see on the bottom right hand side, the, the halogen lamp. And I just want to point out, actually, I had to magnify the scale 10 times so that you could actually see something from the halogen lamp. Whereas you'll notice that the LED headlamps all have uh, very high peaks. Uh, they're all on the same scale. So because that was kind of small, I've just taken two here, um, the surge tail neutral and the Lumidense. You can see the huge peak, and of note here, the peak is round about 440 nanometers. And this is actually at the peak of the blue light hazard at 440 with a range of like 420 to 460. Now, if we look at the ratios of the uh, blue light to the uh, green light, blue-green light from headlamps, you can see that the social headlamps have the lowest ratios compared to the other headlamps. So that's what we found in the study. We we're looking at the ratio of the, of the peaks. When we look at the color temperature of the headlamps, color temperature is measured in K kelvins. We'll see that they range from just over 3000 to almost 8000. And there's a significant difference between the different brands of headlamps. So there's quite a range of the, the color values. Now, if we look at the curing lights, the old uh, packed plasma arc and the quartz halogen curing lights, although they produce blue light, they didn't produce great spikes of blue light. When we look at the emission spectra from LED curing lights, we'll see huge peaks in the uh, blue range, uh, the most dangerous blue range for the eyes. So why is all this a concern? What do we know about these studies? We'll see here that in JADA in 1996, they came up with between 13 to 61 minutes a day. Ericsson, uh, kind of similar values. Uh, Satrum, similar values. And then in 2016, we reported a study that was about 11 minutes from a packed light. And this was uh, reflected from a tooth. Now, you've got to remember that this is the total cumulative exposure. To go into our study in a little bit more detail, we really simulated the clinical situation. Uh, we can see that we had human teeth and uh, we shone the light uh, onto the facial surfaces of the teeth and then we measured the amount of reflected light at a distance of uh, 40 centimeters away. And we also looked at the reflected light through loops. We wanted to see what was the effect of loops because here we can see what happens to, to light that goes through a loop. We can see the shadow of the loop, and we can see the surrounding light, and we can see that bright spot in the center. Now that bright spot in the center is actually focused on your retina. So this explains maybe why we don't look at the sun through binoculars. So we wanted to see the effects of magnification. You'll notice that when you look at the, um, the power on the left-hand side there, you'll see the power is much lower than when you are wearing loops. We'll see the radiance goes up when you are wearing loops. So when we think about that, we wonder, okay, does that mean it's a problem? Well, surprisingly, because the image is much larger, the uh, actual hazard is probably going to be a little bit less because the image is two and a half or three times, five times bigger than the normal. 
And here we can see the actual hazard when we calculate it with no loops, although the power is much less and the radiance is, is lower because the area of which it's uh, over, the exposure time is around about 10 minutes. Whereas when we have a magnified image, so it's over a, a larger area, then we see actually that the exposure time is going to be a little bit longer. So ranging from 20 minutes to 25 minutes, somewhere in that region. In the office, that you know, 25 minutes could easily be exceeded during the normal uh, working day. Now, I don't want to scare you with those, those numbers because there really is a very easy solution. Use the shields or the goggles. If you use those, then you're going to be safe. In 2017, we reported that even the worst glasses that we tested blocked out more than 97% of the dangerous blue light. Interestingly, we did notice that not all the filters blocked out the light below 415 nanometers. Now, when you think about it, this makes sense because the ones that didn't block it out, those manufacturers actually didn't make uh, curing lights that emitted any light below 415. It was only the, the polywave manufacturers that made the shields um, that actually blocked out the lower range, range of wavelengths, which is what their lights produce. It just makes common sense that uh, that's what the manufacturer would kind of focus on. Also, if you think about lasers, you know, you know that lasers come in different wavelengths and you have to buy the appropriate protective eyewear for the appropriate laser that you're using. So in conclusion, cool white LEDs produce a lot of blue light. The total cumulative daily exposure may very well be exceeded but just remember, you can completely block all of the, the dangerous blue light simply by putting down the orange shield on your headlamps and using your headlamps with the orange shield. It works very well and it eliminates the blue light hazard. And if you use the orange shield when you're doing light curing, then of course that eliminates the hazard as well. I'd also like you to think about the fact that dentists are the perfect guinea pigs to test if the blue light hazard even exists in the workplace. We're bathed in blue light from our curing lights, from our headlamps, from our operatory lights. And yes, although many studies have been done on animals, you know, we obviously can't test that out on humans other than just looking at dentists over a long period of time, but they would really make the, the ideal subjects for any kind of longitudinal study on does the blue light hazard really exist? With that, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Daniel Labrie, Fred Rugerberg, Ellen Brazel, George Sliney, and the co-authors on the paper that you see on the right, uh, Marie Fluon, James Mace, Anjali Shah, and of course, Jack Farrakane. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention students, Justine Moe, Mitchell Young, and Braden Sullivan, who've really helped with these studies 